I'm Jotaro. And we'd like to start with some gameplay footage. Now, this gameplay footage would be completely unremarkable, except for the fact that the person playing it is blind. This is Edis using a haptic device to be able to play this game. And the device that he's using is called Dual Panto. Now, current displays for blind users for video games might look something more like this. This is an audio game that might run on your smartphone. And what's going to happen is a little target, a little cursor is going to start sliding across, and the volume will get louder as it approaches the bullseye. And you tap on the screen to be able to shoot. You've got one shot left. You've got seven points. I think you need more practice, my dear Bowman. So when I said typical, I actually meant an award-winning audio game. This is probably pretty good for what's out there, but it still reduces space to scanning. The users have to wait for that target to cross the entire sp uh, to cross the space. So what happens when we actually use spatial interaction? So this is Terry. He's a YouTuber, and on his channel, um, he's playing through the Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time. He's also blind. His setup has two speakers, which give him spatial audio. And he's, uh, this is critical, he's playing this in a virtual machine, which allows him to save the state and then restore that state when he's playing the game. And he's going to try and attempt a very targeted jump. Now this one challenge I have, I have to try to figure out where to jump still. And it's kind of a trial and error thing where the save state comes in really handy. So I'm going to try it here. Nope. So unfortunately, he doesn't have the information available to be able to track this target. And this target is static. This is probably an easier condition. It gets even harder when objects move. When you only have audio, the player might get stuck because they can't have that information about the environment or about where their target is and how their target is moving. And so when he gets later on in the game, he uh, runs into this situation. He saves. Save. Ow. Try to get out of the way. And unfortunately, it was a very poorly timed save, and it takes him a little bit while, a little bit while to get out of this situation. He just doesn't have the information to track these moving objects. Now, most solutions would typically use sound or vibration as sonar. You would point towards an enemy, or you kind of listen for that volume to increase or decrease, or pitch to go up or down, maybe vibrotactile feedback. But users still need to scan or wait. They need to look around in the room, or they need to wait for that feedback. We have a different approach, which we call Dual Panto. Dual Panto is a haptic device that enables blind users to continuously interact in virtual worlds. It consists of two parts. There's a me handle, which lets users act in their environment, and an it handle, which shows users moving objects in the world. And what I'd like to do is give you a demo. Hopefully, you've checked out our demo at the demo session yesterday. But if you missed it, we can do that right now. So what I need everyone to do is uh, please shake your neighbor's hand. Everyone, come on, do this, let's do it. Now hold the hand. You're gonna just keep holding your hands for a while, okay? We're getting nice and cozy. <laughs> everyone on my right is gonna draw a shape, like a circle, a square, a triangle, whatever you wanna do. But you're both gonna close your eyes, okay? The person on the left, you're just gonna let them lead you around, okay? So three, two, one. Close your eyes and draw. Okay. People on the left, were you able to figure out what shape it was? Yes? No? Mostly so? Yeah. So you just experienced a single panto, which gave you a continuous spatial interaction with your neighbors without sight. And no other game for visually impaired players does this. Let me explain how it works. So, as you said, the system consists of two main handles, like main components. It's called me handle and int handle. So, let me take an example of soccer game uh, and then explain how me handle works. Okay. 
And then usually you can grab the meat handle as move around. This will also move a soccer player on the uh, virtual field, the soccer virtual area world in the soccer field. And you usually can also turn a virtual avatar there by rotating the handle. And since this is a haptic device, you usually can also feel the, uh, the virtual environment like a wall or obstacle. Okay, so how about um, when we encounter moving objects in the virtual world? In that sense, it handle can do the job. In this example, a soccer ball. So the it handle, the system will actuate the it handle to show the position of the, uh, of the soccer ball in the field. And then my user can hold the it handle and then know and sense the position of the soccer ball at the moment, just like this. The key idea is here, a me handle and it handle has the same shared workspace. And that says, you combine all these things, the user can approach to the soccer ball to take it, just like this, and give a kick, and do it again, and finally, score a goal. So, the key idea is here. So, dual panel, use, with dual panel, user can act in a virtual world, but at the same time, user can sense or user, uh, the system can provide information to the user at the same time. So, this enables blind users a continuous and spatial interaction without any necessity of seeing or um, waiting or scanning the virtual world. So, I would like to explain the hardware setup. Um, the key novelty is that we use the two handles, but still, uh, we need a haptic device. In this project, uh, we started from the uh, haptic, haptic panel graph design at a starting point. Just, just uh, the device looks like this. And then, uh, this is our prototype. And then, the haptic device has to be, in order to give a precise haptic, device, uh, haptic rendering, the linkages has to be really strong and rigid, but also the smooth. So we used a aluminum linkages, and we also used a um, Teflon uh, Teflon washers on the joint on the linkages. For rotation, uh, we use a small motor and uh, motors with encoders with a low gear ratio, so that you can user can easily turn it on. On the bottom uh, it handle. The system has to actuate the rotation of the handle to let users know what the object is facing. So we used a um, higher gear ratio than the top handle, or the me handle. A higher gear ratio of the motor encoder. So, what about the shape of the, uh, the handle? So we actually tried a bunch of uh, several handles that are with shapes and sizes. And our final design yields into this shape, the teardrop shape, which allows users to let know where the handle is pointing uh, between different finger postures. So, about the haptic uh, rendering techniques, uh, we utilized uh, existing haptic rendering techniques, uh, for example, for me handles. Uh, we use god object techniques, uh, which is um, which can which allows to render walls or uh, like curvatures or polygons on the virtual world, the complex shape. Also, we used a virtual coupling techniques in order to render an uh, object um, of um, object which is away from the end effect of the it a me handle. For it handle, uh, we use simple PID controllers for position rendering, and also for rotational rendering. So to evaluate dual panto, we recruited six participants, all of whom were visually impaired, two from birth, to use the device. We introduced them to the device and to the soccer game, and this process took about eight to 15 minutes. After training, each participant played the match, and then they provided their feedback. All participants were able to play the game, and they reported very high enjoyment, so 6.5 out of 7.
<laughs> that wasn't planned, by the way. So we did some video and interview analysis to understand what the experience was like to use the device, and we came up with three main findings. The first was that participants had a spatial awareness of the world. Players were able to pass to their partners during training and shoot past their opponents during games, which meant that they could act while tracking where the other person was and they were able to do corner shots and other tricks like that. So we had quotes like, yes, I could definitely move the player to the ball and everything. And, oh, that shot was on my goal. They could also move to the center of the field or either end just by spatial memory of the environment. Multiplayer experiences naturally emerged from gameplay. So we had participants uh, playing both with and against uh, sighted and visually impaired players. So, um, yeah. People were really excited about this, like, ah, cool, there are two players. And some people thought, hey, it'd be great if there were even more. And we had some taunts, like, I'll crush you, but you have to close your eyes. <laughs> this was actually really cool because it meant that we had sighted players and blind users playing together and all having a good time, a really inclusive experience. We ended up having these little uh, micro tournaments. That's the, a second participant, another participant saying they like crushing the opponent. So we have some competitive participants. And you've already seen this impromptu um, co-op mode that just kind of emerged. So one person's operating the pantograph, the other one's operating the foot pedal. Um, and it's just because they both just really wanted to play. And this was really fun. The final thing was that dual pando could be some sort of audio haptic console, and this could be really beneficial for users. Participants liked that you could instantly hear sounds. They liked that it was really interactive. And there was some extra insight we had, too. For blind people, it's nice when you, don't have, when you have these things at home because you don't need to adjust many settings. Participants said that they could just play for a half hour when they feel like it. So it's not only accessible in that it's replacing modalities, it's also reducing the barrier to being able to actually use the devices. You can kind of pick up and play. So this seemed like it would be the right model to use this device. One participant even said, 150 euros? That would be worth it even if it's only a few mini-games for now. Yeah. Vor allem kann ich das dann jetzt spielen, wenn ich möchte. Also hier muss ich halt nicht warten, bis er irgendwas gemacht hat. Nee, also es gibt wirklich die Möglichkeit, dann dadurch zu spielen. Es zieht rein, wie bei Computerspiel. So in conclusion. Dual Panto is a haptic device that enables blind users to continuously interact in virtual worlds. With Dual Panto, apps can move beyond 1D scanning to actual spatial interaction. And here's Edis defeating some Zom bunnies once again. Now, previously, we presented two other devices displaying interactive spatial content for people who are blind. At Kai 2016, we presented Line Space, which printed lines in a large area, so you had tactile spatial content and dynamic audio interaction. And last year at World Haptics, we presented LinePod, a mobile version of this that allowed you to feel um, interactive spatial content, again, while doing dynamic audio interaction. And these represent uh, one modality, which is uh, discrete turn-taking. So you had to take your hands off when something changed, or if something changed, you wouldn't know where it was. So you'd have to move your hands around to scan again to see. And this is why we're so excited about Dual Panto, is because it really offers this continuous interaction. You get push notification of when something changes in the world when you have something as spatial, and we think that's really cool, and we're hoping to explore it more. Now, of course, we didn't do this alone, so I'd like to thank all my co-authors, um, all of our co-authors on this work, um, and if you're interested in, if you know someone who's interested in working on cool haptics work like this, you can, of course, talk to any of us, especially Patrick Bowdish at HPI, or you can tell someone to talk to me, because I'm starting a new lab at the University of Waterloo, and so uh, people are excited about this, tell them to get in contact, in contact with me. Thank you so much, and we'd be happy to answer some questions. So we have two microphones. One is right there, one is there in the center. Hmm, Post-lunch fatigue. OK, I start with one question. I expect another. OK, um, so what I like best about this is that you're encoding state in like a spatial reference system in the system as opposed mm -hmm. to sound, which when it encodes state is like kind of 
obnoxious, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, sound you can do you can do like massive amounts of sound overlay, and we're pretty yeah. good at telling yeah. them apart. So I wonder yeah. if you've thought of like sort of complementary approaches here to not just supplement that. But, I mean, it's sort of this trade-off, right? Yeah. You have a you have a stable reference here with the yeah. haptics, which is really great, right? Yeah. And the, the, the encoding the state costs you nothing, yeah. right? Because you hold on to it. Yeah. Whereas in the sound, you can do multiple things at once. Yeah. So I wonder if you thought of the sort of the uh, complementary nature of them. Right. So, I mean, I, I constantly am debating this, whether it's primarily a haptic or an audio design when you do these things. Uh, certainly, a lot of the effort is audio design, right? The entire interaction needs to be explained. We can, most of the rich information um, and, and any ephemeral, rapidly dynamic information we can provide through audio. Um, but you're right, it is anchored by this. So, yeah, we, we had to give a lot of thought to audio design in all the things we do. Um, for the soccer game, you know, that tells you maybe who has the, the ball, it tells you when you score, you have to have that kind of staple stuff um, also updated. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've thought a bit about how you can load audio and we're thinking more about how to do that. Does that answer yeah, your yeah. question? Or? That's pretty good. Yeah, okay. cool. We have, now we have a question. Is that Jan? Okay. Hi, Jan, uh, Ulm University. Great talk, thanks. Thanks. Um, I had a question. What you have is you have one dynamic um, object. Have you thought about how can you extend it if I have multiple? So if I want to know my players I can pass to and my ball, so do you need more haptical things or can you just extend it through round robin what's the most close or interesting dynamic object? Right. So that's, uh, that's a tricky issue. So uh, that's the big limitation with the device that's implemented is you only get one it uh, right now. So when it comes to something like Zombunny, we or the soccer game, we multiplex. So mm -hmm. it would show the nearest target. Um, we thought about maybe you can switch between the different targets. So we haven't solved that yet. We thought that maybe you, you can do it either haptically or maybe you can do an interaction design, and it depends on the complexity of the world. So that's sort of the active next step. Um, so if you have ideas, let us know, because this is sort of the big thing we're trying to improve. Anything to add? Or? No, that's, that's good. good. Cool. OK, Mary. Hi, I'm Meredith Ringle Morris from Microsoft Research. So this is really interesting, and I definitely see how it applies to the soccer game, but I'm having trouble envisioning how this might generalize to other genres of game. Could you talk a little bit more about other kinds of activities that this same system is a good match for and what the limitations are? Oh. Um. Right, so we, we focused on gaming because we thought that was a really hard, fun use case. Um, and it seemed a natural fit for dynamic spatial content. We have a couple implementations, um, not in this part of this publication, um, but we've been exploring how you might do this for other types of spatial content that can change and how you might render that. So we have some ideas of how to do that. Um, it's not just you know a soccer ball. Uh, we think we can do a lot more complex interaction. But we're still working out both the resolution of the device. You need to have a really good device to be able to do lots of different things, as well as careful interaction design, especially with audio and how you interweave the haptics in the audio. Does that answer your question? I feel like I kind of yeah. Well, I, I, I think it. gaming. I'm not saying that gaming is too small a limitation. I was actually wondering within gaming specifically, it seems like you know games where you kick a ball are only one genre of many right. possible games. And I was wondering if you could comment within gaming what categories of games does dual panto work well for, and what categories of games do right. not express um, themselves that way? Yeah, so um, there's certainly several, a lot of different kinds of games that can work. This might be best offline, because it's we haven't, like, we don't have defined categories yet, um, but we're kind of exploring those limits now. So maybe we should talk in the break or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, let's thank the speakers again.